Hi guys, how you going? So, um, yeah, Chris got me at a weak moment. I, I just thought I'd bring my gear in so you can actually see what I carried through the hills. Chris got me at a weak moment um, after the um, Aorang Yundulator, which he um, set up a couple of years ago. Um, I, I ran it back in 2014 for the first time. I think that was the first official race. And um, he sent me an email shortly after that, um, that weekend saying, um, here's your next challenge, mate. <laughs> And um, being being young and impressionable, well not so young but impressionable, I uh, sort of had a, had a had a wee look at the um, the SK and then seen that um, Chris Swallow um, who I'd run with and, and Lawrence had um, done it a couple of years beforehand and thought, oh, that can't be too hard. And <laughs> the brilliant thing about um, about a map of the Terra Rose is everything's so flat and. Um, I think pulling out the map, um, having not been in the terrors for, for quite a while, I'd, I'd sort of, um, you, you quickly forget how steep those hills are. Um, but anyway, I, I decided, okay, well, um, I'm up for another challenge. And um, so I started doing a bit of research and, um, and um, decided I'd refresh my memories of the terrors and headed in to um, do a climb up um, from Otaki Forks to Mount Hector just, just to get my head back in the hills um, and also have a look at Bridge Peak which um, somebody had mentioned was um, a fun part of the SK um, usually when, when your legs are starting to talk back to you and so I went up there, remembered how steep the hills are um, and thought okay I've got a bit of, bit of training to do um, doing, doing the undulator is um, light and, a light and fast approach and um, through the reading that I'd done on the SK, um, I think uh, Gary Goldsworthy's um, approach of, of the solo unsupported approach really resonated with me. Um, not to take away at all from the guys doing it fast and light, um, I, I just felt like I needed an adventure that I could do um, that, that where the motivation was, was entirely on my own back um, to get myself all the way through. Um, and so I, I think the, the um, thing, the biggest question in my head was the fact that I'd only ever run five hours. Five hours was, was the longest time I'd ever spent in the hills um, that was doing the Southern Crossing. Um, and so um, it goes back to that question is can I even do um, something longer than that? Um, let, let, let alone a day, this is talking more, more about 24 hours and so I think the, the next thing that I set out to do was um, try and do some longer runs and, and work out um, whether my, my body and, and my mind were, were actually cracked up to do this and so I set myself a target, we um, had um, Christmas up in Taranaki with my, um, my family, um, my brother's up that way and so um, Steve Neary and Malcolm Law um, had recently um, done um, a, a run where they went up to the summit of um, Taranaki, um, back down and then all the way around the mountain and that had taken them something like 14 hours and I thought oh, okay so I'm up there, um, got Boxing Day um, and it be, be a good time to go for a run. Um, and so me and, me and Dad and my brother headed in to do that um, and uh, they, they, they went up to top and back well I, I shot off to the top and, um, and did my run around the mountain and um, I surprised myself it's as, as um, it was either Chris or Chris said um, once, once, once you've been running for five hours the, the pain's no different from um, when, when I finished um, 12 hours later um, yeah. <laughs> in fact I think once once you get past the five hour mark all those little niggles have sort of turned into one big niggle and so <laughs> it's, um, it sort of it's, it keeps, keeps your mind from wandering to, to the little niggles. Um, yeah so um, having done that I, I think that, that cemented in my mind that um, I, could, I could run bigger. Um, and I think that's, that's a good thing to look, look at if, if um, you've only been doing, I don't know, um, four, five, six hour runs um, is um, you're, you're capable of doing much bigger than that um, and I think every time you do a bigger run you, you realise that the boundaries are just there to be pushed further and further out um, and so having done that um, everyone had talked about the northern section of the, um, of the SK um, going in from Putara um, out to Puki Matawai 
um, which is all, um, there's a foot trail um, in places it's better than others, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's me. I, I took far too many photos, that's, that's another thing. If, you, <laughs> if you're not wanting to push hard for the time, then leave your camera at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It slowed, slowed me down on a recent trip in the hills. Um, but yeah, oh, being, being up there, I, I actually got a magic day. Um, it was um, probably the, the hottest day of that summer, um, which, which was a, a blessing and a curse at the same time. Um, there, there wasn't a breath of wind until I think the Tower of Ladders um, and then that was just a breath of wind and it went away again so it was a scorching hot day. Um, I've got, well I think I lost a bottle over there but I basically carried four bottles and um, there's a couple of sections right at the start from Heropi Hut through to Drak Biv um, where you need to carry quite a lot of um, water. Um, yeah, 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 and and I was, it had been it had been really hot for um, a, a couple of weeks before that, and I was kind of worried that because it's part of the TR uh, trail that yeah, well, Chris, it uh, could have been um, drained. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't be very fun to come to this hut and find the it empty because you, you've got five hours um, leading up to that from here if I hut along the tops until you you get there but they had water in it when, when I got there um, sorry this this is my PowerPoint presentation on paper um, so basically I, I'm, I'm just going to go through a few of the um, things that I focused on when I was um, out there um, I, I think um, Chris and Colin have both said it. Um, a, a lot of it's just a power tramp. Like people picture you going up there and um, and running it all, and it's just unless you're a mutant, um, I, I just don't think it's possible. Um, there'd, there'd be somebody if you're travelling really light and had everyone carrying your stuff for you, um, then you, you might be able to run run a fair bit of it. But um, a lot of that northern section, um, the conditions underfoot, you can't even see where you're putting your feet, and so. Um, it's it's not really a mountain run. Um, there are some sections that you can you can pace through just to tick off a bit of time, um, but it's it's really just a fast trek. So um, if you're not a fast runner, it doesn't mean that you can't can't do it. Um, Basically, when, when um, I I had my pace notes like um, Chris was um, talking about, and I found that between the huts, it was really good to have something to push towards. Um, and also, as part of that, I had um, the amount of water that I was going to pick up in each hut, so that I could go in um, knowing exactly what I was going to do at the hut. I, I up until a uh, trip after the SK, I'd never been into a tower or hut, <laughs> so, so you don't you don't have to have a tramping background to to get amongst it either. Um, and so um, I, I basically um, made it a rule for myself that I wasn't going to go into any of the huts. I was going to treat each of the huts like a transition. Um, I, I come from a multi multi sport background where. Um, you, you change from bike to running to kayaking and you try to keep the transitions as quick as possible because every time that you're sitting down um, you're not going forward and the time's ticking away um, and if you're trying to get in under 24 hours um, then it's really good to think about those those times at the stops. Um, so I'd go in knowing exactly how many bottles I wanted to fill up um, and um, have a big drink, th throw some water in the bottles and get going again um, so that um, the temptation to, to stay sitting wasn't there to go into a nice comfy hut. Um, again, um, Chris, Chris was talking about the food. I think for me, um, I, I've always run on gels and um, so I, I actually set my backpack up so that I didn't have to go into it at all while I was on the go. So maybe I've put on a bit of weight since I last wore this. And so I basically had a, a gel bottle here, water bottles there, and had my um, watch set to um, a 20 minute timer, so it would beep at me every 20 minutes. I'd knock some gel back, um, I was drinking water constantly, um, and that way it just took my mind totally off the feeding um, and just 
gave me time to concentrate on going ahead. Um, and it's just about pairing things back. If you're, if you're wanting to do it quick, it's, um, you, you don't want to be carrying any extras. Having said that, you want to be carrying enough to be safe if you're out there um, and do yourself an injury and end up having to stay out on the tops over, overnight. I basically carried enough that um, if I needed to, I could have um, pulled up at the side of the track and set the PLB off and waited there for any amount of time. Um, one, one of the tricks that I think that um, a few people have probably discovered in this, their SKs is take a spare torch. Um, <laughs> I think, think Colin, Colin may have run into that problem and, and also Chris. Um, and um, it also helps when you're changing the batteries of your good torch as well. I, um, I was in a fairly in, interesting state, um, I'd, I'd say probably altered state by the time I um, got about halfway along Marchant Ridge and my battery ran out. And um, if I was fumbling in the dark um, for my batteries um, without without a spare torch, I think I um, I might have ended up um, asleep at the side of the track for <laughs> until the sun came up and somebody came in looking for me. Um, so um, yeah, I, I just carried a tiny little emergency torch. Um, yeah, my my mobile phone isn't a flash. <laughs> yeah, and and so. Um, the other thing that I did was, um, because I'd, I'd, ha I'd been in as far as Dundas on the recce that I did with um, Chris Swallow, and everything from Dundas on to the top of Ridge Peak, um, I hadn't been along before. Um, and I think for, for me, part of it was the adventure and, and discovering some new country. Um, and so I'd, um, I'd studied the maps pretty well so I'd, um, and, and made some notes on where things could go wrong, read other people's reports on, on where they ran into troubles. Um, but um, yeah, basically I just had the different sections cut into segments so that, again, I didn't have to stop if I needed to check something. I had it hanging at my front and um, you could keep on moving. Um, and I think all, all of that adds, like when, when you um, pushing to get under 24 hours, um, as, as Paul Helm um, will tell you, um, it's a few, few minutes under 24 hours. If he had stopped a couple of other, couple more times or um, anything like that, then it's it's just a number. But it's when when you when you've spent 24 hours out there trying to get under 24 hours, then a number is a big thing. Um, yeah, so I I think. Um, the, the the best point that Chris made um, was Chris Swallow made was um, you want to prepare for it going and not knowing necessarily whether you can do it um, but going and confident that you've done everything you can to prepare to do it um, things can come up and you may have to change plans but um, having that confidence going into it and, and really knowing that you've prepared um, does a huge amount mentally. Um, uh, I, I think you, you need to be in the right headspace um, and be comfortable knowing that your might, mind might go a little bit funny on uh, Marchant Ridge. It's, it's uh, not a bad place to be as long as you, you, you're happy to go slow for a while. So, yeah. Right. Thanks, everyone. Good one, Tim. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.